this is, this is, this is. All right, here we are. Uh, I thought we'd do a gear episode, a sponsorship episode, talk about the, the companies and, that we work with, that we partner with, and talk about the gear that we use. I would love to talk about your guitars. Um, first and foremost, here we are. We're in Bremerton, Washington, upstairs in the studio. The North Room. The North Room. My favorite room in the studio, by the way. It sounds great in here. It's a great guitar room. But yeah, we did the, the guitars for the whole record in here. There was a cabinet just sitting back in the corner behind you couple mics on it a room mic over in that corner boom yeah it's just it's got that warm tone but not it's not too dead so a lot of times you think warm you think really dead but it's got some life to it as well so uh let's uh let's talk about real quick before we get into the gear stuff between this world and the next um we've got some shows on our belts yeah we do yeah. what's your experience been like my experience was for the first one, I was kind of like a little bit like, oh, is this going to be weird? Like, is this going to be odd? Like, just playing to like a camera or whatever. And it was kind of like, I had a little trepidation going into it. And I was like, well, everyone's really excited about it. I'll just kind of roll with it. And it's the only way we can play shows right now for people. So got to gotta get into it. And like, as soon as like the first one was over, I was like, okay, I was actually really fun. Like, this works, you know? Yeah. This could be a cool thing. Like I said, like I, said I was just, didn't know what to expect. Just so different from a real show you know pe sweaty people in front of you and jumping around on stage and just doing all that craziness but uh i mean it's fun you know come over come over to the studio kick it with you guys for a while you know we'll warm up a little bit turn on the mics and say hi to everyone and turn on the cameras and then all of a sudden here we are we're playing a show for a bunch of people yeah it's crazy it's, it's cool because it, it it is a show but it's not the same type of show it's its own new kind of medium it's yeah. It's on the screen, you know, you're watching on your phone or on your giant TV, but it is different and you kind of have to communicate to people a little bit differently. You can't be like all, hey, how's everybody going out there? <laughs> yeah. and you can't do the whole rock and roll thing. You have to be real with people. And, and, and even sometimes we're not even talking to the cameras. We're talking to each other and yeah. just kind of having – sometimes that's actually hard for me is sometimes I – almost forget about the show and i'm just thinking oh we're in practice or we're just playing together because it's exactly where we practice too so it is it's just it's comfortable and it's it could almost be too comfortable like we're just like cracking fart jokes and we're like oh wait we're on camera <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was thinking too like uh just the man i don't even know how to say it i don't know it's just it's cool just being in, in the room where we do everything because like, where we practice the whole new records where we practiced for years just to you know, and now here it is. We're filming it, and it's it's different from almost I think pretty much every live stream I've seen. Everyone's like renting big halls or like cool like TV studios, and it looks. I mean, some people's like Jimmy Eat World and Ambulance. Those look incredible because they're like these like beautiful sets and lighting, and it's just like it's really nice. But I mean, like I feel like that'd be kind of weird for us. Like I like the fact yeah. that it's like us in our living room. It's like hey, here we are. It's stripped down. It's home kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's on whatever you call brand. I, I hate saying that, but it's, it's on, on brand for it's us. It's on brand yeah. for us, yeah. which is it's real. It's it's raw but solid and good and you know, you can tell that we, we put work into it. I think my favorite part honestly, I didn't I thought this was gonna be the opposite starting out. And like you, everybody was probably you know, we had positive vibes, but we we're just hoping that, that the, the live live on the internet is gonna be great you know it's going to be something that we can feel comfortable doing which obviously it's turned out to be great but um i thought that you know at the beginning the hardest part was going to be learning old songs learning deep deep tracks not even all always old songs sometimes just obscure deep tracks songs we never really did never really learned learned just enough to record yeah, and that's the thing I was going to mention, too, is that, like, when it first started, I thought, like, hey, we're not playing punk rock show. That's weird. Like, we always play that song. Like, we're kind of supposed to, right? And I think I picked up on it after, like, the first one. I'm like, this is, like, for, like, the real fans. And, like, they're going to be amped up that we play some real deep tracks. I mean, I think we counted up after uh, the last stream. We're up to, like, 118 individual songs now. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Like, and I think people are really, really digging on that. Like, it's almost like 
a guessing game coming up to them. Like, where people are like, oh, are they going to play Bad Air Day this time or whatever? Are they, they going to play this? Like, and, like Someday we'll play Bad well, Air Day, right? In the, in, the <laughs> chat, in the chat before this last one, someone mentioned Yuri waking up screaming, and I was like, oh, that's really funny because we're going to play that. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest, those, you know, those songs that get requested over and over and over, we may not do it the next time, but... That's where we're it's working. More likely, from, yeah. yeah. We, we, you know, sometimes you, it's like, oh, we're not quite ready to play that. We didn't practice that enough, or whatever. But uh, going back to my original point, just the the act of practicing and and it hasn't been super insane to like learn some songs or whatever. But going in and practicing with you guys with the band, it once it clicks and it and it's and it, to me it's just like, oh my gosh, this is actually really fun. It's the it's the most rewarding part. Because getting getting to to know that fans are going to be reacting, loving these songs, they're going to be, you know, their minds are going to be blown. Whatever it is, um, at least that's what I'm expecting, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I can just imagine like you know people sitting there watching and like on like song two, we bust into like, you know, do and don't or whatever, and be like, dude, that's like on teenage politics. That's crazy. That's so old. Yeah, I never thought we would do that. Like, if you asked me at the very beginning if we'd be doing half of these songs, I, I would have been like, yeah. ah, maybe not, maybe not. But honestly, getting into it, getting into practice with you guys, and and the key is it's not like we learned 118 songs at once and said, yeah, all right, no, we're ready to go. We're breaking it down. Yeah. We're breaking it down. We're we're doing, I think we're doing the, the doing it in the right bits, you know, like 25 songs here and there. It's doable. And, and not say, every song out of that 25 is is unfamiliar to us. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, I'd say maybe about like a little less than half every time we're like, okay, we're going to play that? Oh, how's that? What record is that on? Yeah. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it works out. I mean, you know, like we make we make a playlist and, you know, we send it to each other and we say, hey, here, here's all the random ones from this set. And Mike will be like, oh, I think we really need to work on this one too. Throw that one in. And we'll, you know, we, we get it all down to, uh, you know, what we need to do and, Everyone sits at home, practices, and then that's the good part is because we can come in and, you know, we're all pretty good at this by now that we can all come in and the first time we practice them, it's like, okay, it's almost there. Or like, ooh, we need some work on this one. You know? Yeah. I wonder what people would want to know about the specific process of how we do Between This World and the Next. I mean, if I, if I was like watching Elvis Costello or The Clash do a live stream, it would be pretty cool to see them in their practice space. Sure. Like where we are in our practice space. And that's what I was thinking. Like it was also different. Like I remember I looked at uh, Lit's, um, their stream, and it was them was it and Lit. lit. <laughs> Dead mm, tune. I don't, I don't know if it was. I wouldn't say it was Lit. But it was in a big rock, you know, venue, whatever it was, like a house blues or something like that, and lights and smoke and all that. But it was just empty, and it was just them on stage, and they were all facing an empty room, and. Like I like that ours we're standing in a circle and we got Johnny just in the middle running around with the camera, you know. I just yeah, I don't like you said, it, it works. It makes sense for us and I I think it'd be weird if we did another another way. Like in hindsight, like yeah. we were coming up with it, and I was like, Is it gonna be okay just in like the living room? But like it'd be weird if it was anything but that. Sure. I mean that's the thing is we can once we try something that works, of course eventually, you know, years later we'll probably try something different different, but uh I love the just the idea that it that it feels right. It feel it doesn't feel like we're faking anything. Yep. We're, we're even though we're not technically we're not playing in front of anybody, but it doesn't feel like we're playing to nobody because we have that camera and we know and we've got the chat room, mm -hmm. so we can see people react when we play, you know, a set of songs and they're like, "Oh my god!" You know, uh, it, it's funny because towards the end of the set, people are constantly asking for this, asking for this play this song and once they realize they're just like wow they're just playing all these songs every song they play is something that i'm kind of into <laughs> and that is that's when you hit it just right uh, and you've got a good set so like um round six was was a great set a good little set of songs i mean they've all been great you know i just feel like as we've gone on they've gotten better and better but it's fun yeah uh, you know mentioning just the fact that like a lot of bands are doing the empty room that's see it's not so much 
the looking at a band playing on a stage because we've seen live concerts on VH1 and all that, you know, MTV and all that for years and years. You know, Bon Jovi videos are always usually live, and that's cool. It's cool to watch, but when when it's a lot an actual live show, it just feels different. Everything just for some reason just feels different. It's immediate. Um, and the cheese factor goes way up somehow if it, if you do it wrong. Yeah, yeah. And then again, those shows you're watching, there's people in the crowd. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, true. You're watching the Eagles live at some you know arena, or you're watching you know whatever, and it's it's all like it's a real show and it's live, and there's a crowd for them to play to. Like, like I don't know. I mean, I needed to watch more of it, I guess. But how do you play to an empty room and like 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 you're not going to pump the crowd up. It's no crowd. It makes you feel weird. So that's, I think, yeah. what's great about what we're doing is I don't feel weird about playing. I feel like, oh, we're doing a show. Here we are. And there's, yeah. the, there's the camera, which is the audience. And, and, you know, like I said at the very beginning, it is a different kind of show. It's a show meant for your screen, not meant for you to be. Sure, it would probably be pretty fun if you were in the room with us. <laughs> well, now, so now, <laughs> I'm thinking, now I'm thinking about, like, we're talking about the lit one, how it was in, like, a big, big empty club. I feel like they missed an opportunity to like, you know, like Mount Rush Enemy. Like they're in a house and they're playing. Like do that. Yeah. Like that would have been great. And they probably still could. Yeah. yeah. I mean, make can. it make it look exactly the same. Like, like their video. We're, we're in that video, you know, like wear the same clothes every guy, but like That's there's, a great idea. There's for... an opportunity there. I mean, like, we'll go play down at the diner and we'll do chick magnet or something. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it was funny because I was I was actually <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever do this, but I had an idea. We should remake Chick Magnet now. So oh. like Yuri, as a you know forty year old man or whatever, doing Chick Magnet, it would be hilarious. But um, throwing his hip out, dancing on the bar. Yeah, just you know, doing the tater tots into fries, <laughs> whatever it is. It was a salt shaker into fries. salt shaker into fries. That's true. That's true. I was thinking, you know, we had to update it for yeah. today's society. It's um, sweet potato fries now or something. It's like turn a turn a silver city beer into plate of fries <laughs> Woo. anyway yeah that that's fun um let's let's talk gear because you know when we were when we were before we started doing the live streams between this world and the next we were talking about building a monitor rig for our live yeah. shows for flyouts um we were possibly going to change up some of the amps that you guys use live but it was all in a effort to make everything we flew with consistent yeah we've done a lot of these flyout shows and the guitar gear is just like oh this garbage what am i gonna do today there's been a progression maybe we should even go back further let's let's go all the way back to when you started playing in mxpx you had an acoustic guitar i remember yeah, yeah. um what was your i mean we can condense this of course but your experience getting your first guitar and then also talk about your first electric guitar so getting the first acoustic was me being a drummer and everyone I knew play guitar except for me. So I was like, well, I should learn, right? You know, I'll learn to play guitar. Everyone else knows they can teach me stuff. So I ran, you know, ran up the flagpole with dad and I think for one of my birthdays or something, we went to a local pawn shop. It's a Mexican restaurant now. Uh, and we just got like a little cheap acoustic. I didn't know anything and it had plastic strings on it. I'm like, oh, those weren't hurt my fingers as much. That'll be neat. You know, like, <laughs> yeah didn't know that's oh it's a classical got it but it was a regular acoustic a steel string acoustic with plastic strings i don't know why Mm -hmm. but yeah it was just uh it was fun because i would get it and i would play along with like a green day and bad religion songs and just try to figure it out by ear and like you know did you kind of instantly click with you it wasn't it kind of made sense a little bit, yeah. Because you had been playing in bands as a drummer. Yeah, and asking, like, you and, like, Giles and Dale and people like that, like, hey, you know, what about this? And they'd show me things. and That's cool. Yeah. My first acoustic is right here, actually. It's my mom's, and it's <laughs> a classical as well. So it had nylon That's an strings. actual classical, yeah. Yeah. So it's a really wide neck. Um, and I started messing around on that back before I even started playing bass as well. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's not that it necessarily just clicked right away and I was like, oh, I'm a great guitarist. But, I mean, I had friends and, you know, high school, you had nothing to do except for sit in your room, play guitar, whatever. And it was it was just really fun sitting there trying to figure And the reward of figuring out a song, I'm like, oh, my God, like, I know how to play that now. Cool. I still do that. Like, if I hear a song or if I hear a riff, and I'm just like, 
that's really cool. What is that? And I have to go figure it out. And it's usually much simpler than I thought it was going to be and much more. I'm like, oh, I get what they're doing there. That's cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I love that. Um, that's pretty much how I started playing guitar slash bass. Bad to the bone. Do, 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 <laughs> do, 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 do. And once I realized, oh, you can actually, I can make it sound like it sounds on the radio when I hear it. Like, <laughs> what? And I think also when you're that new and young to it, they're like, even if it's in the same ballpark as that sound it's exact it's exactly it's, it's the like, same it's better it's like you know, like i was thinking like <laughs> when we were playing rainy day on the last uh live stream when i heard that recorded and played back to us i was like we sound just as good as green day like this is amazing yeah and like listening to it now i was like okay it's obviously not but <laughs> yeah but i mean like it was just like it was in the same ballpark and i'm like yep that's it we we made it you know <laughs> whatever yeah. so you got um so you had that, and that's when, so when you joined MXPX, you didn't even own an electric guitar, I don't think. I, I think you had that, that acoustic so. still, and you're like, okay, well, I got to get an electric guitar. Yeah, I think I bought, I, again, hey, Dad, <laughs> <laughs> um, talked him into it for, like, my birthday and Christmas one year, and I got a an Epiphone SG and a, a Marshall Half Stack, and, I mean, Marshall Half Stack was awesome, but it was, like, I knew I would need a real amp because I was going to go play in like a band that was playing shows and we were playing shows around like on, you know, at least a weekend a month kind of thing. And it was like, it was awesome. It was like, Oh, we're playing shows this is great. You know, normally like in bands before that, it'd be like play a couple, three, four shows a year. And it was like, Oh my God, we're really doing something now. Like, yeah. So it was more, it was more consistent. So I'm like, yeah, I need some good gear. Uh, and yeah, I had that. That uh, was the first time we had, well, one, none of us had a Marshall half stack. So in MXPX, and so when you brought that, it was like, oh, a real amp, rather than the, all these combo amps, these practice amps that right. we had used. Andy Hughes said had he had, he had an crate. Ep, he had a crate first, yeah. and then and then he had an Epiphone. Did he? I don't remember. I remember. The, I remember the Ep crate. Maybe the, the, so the crate looked like one of those Fender amps, like okay. a Tweed. It, it I think was, no, I think he had a, like a some sort of Fender at one point too. Maybe, but like a new Fender. It definitely wasn't right for our sound. Like it was like, right. you know, it was. Uh, we didn't know back then. You know, we, we just thought you get an amp, whatever we can afford, that's yeah. what we should get. So we would just get things that were cheap and available at DJ's music. Yep. Yeah, but I I did that uh that amp, and it was more like I talked Dad into like you know get it for me and like you know I'll pay it back. Like we're playing shows, I'm gonna make some money. And I had him paid back, except for like maybe two hundred bucks before we went on our first tour and. Came home from the first tour, gave him 200 bucks, like, here you go, that's it. And he was like, wow, I really just kind of wrote that money off when I bought that amp for you. Like, I figured I'd never see it again. I'm like, told you I'd pay back, man. <laughs> yeah. That's a good feeling. Yeah, yeah. I was like, like, I'm playing in a band and doing enough to, like, buy an amp. Like, yeah, it took me, like, a year or whatever, but still. So why did you, why did you buy uh what made you buy that Marshall? It was just, that was the go-to amp of the day. You look at every band that you see playing, and it was it was all Marshall half stacks, and it was a it was what, a what JCM amp? it was a JCM nine hundred, which was the current one, and there was two versions of it. And That's been JCM nine hundred forever. I mean, they've come out with the two thousand yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, it was a JCM nine hundred high gain dual reverb, and I'm like high gain. Yep, cool. Need that. Two channels with the foot. I was able to do switch. channels. Yeah, and I just uh. I just kind of bought it. Like, I mean, I went out to Kitsap Music and I messed with a 5150 uh, PV. Mm -hmm. And it was just a little kind of metally sounding. And We were I going mean, for like the surf vibe. Like, just, I just wanted to sound like Green Day, you know? Like, yeah. Something like, that. like, you know, because Billy Joe, I mean, those guitars sound great. Or like Bad Religion, just like that nice, full, warm sound. Yeah. And so I saw everyone playing Marshalls. I'm like, yep, yeah, guess I play Marshall. That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, got that one. It worked great. I mean, took it on tour. Flew to Japan with it, like, in, like, 95. Remember that? Me and my dad built a little road case for it out of, like, wood and, like, screws. And, I mean, it I absolutely it absolutely <laughs> fell apart, like, <laughs> from flying one time. But it got it got it tuned from Japan. So, hey, whatever. Yeah. That's crazy that we, we used to fly with full-on amps. Um, yeah. Pre-911. So, yeah. So, how long did you play your SG? Uh, I think I got back from that first, yeah, we got back from that first tour 
we made a little money on the tour. I mean, you know, just play enough shows and, you know, don't spend it all on gas and you're going to end up with a little, bit, a little bit of money. There was no cell phone bills at that point. There's no cell phone, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I came back and I bought a uh, Gibson SG. So just like the the real version of... So you went from Epiphone F- SG to Gibson. Yeah, so I went. I basically like... I like realized, oh, I just... I, I like did the pro level one now, you know. And that guitar was great. I mean, I loved it. It was kind of weird. Like uh, when, I let, when I took my hands off, it, SGs are really head heavy. So just like the headstock just like would shoot straight to the ground. Mm-hmm. But it still it was it was fun. Played that one for a while. I don't even know what happened to it honestly. I don't know if I sold it or what, but I don't have it anymore. So weird. I have no idea where it is. I still have my first bass. Yeah, that PV. PV. Yeah, PVT yeah. forty. Yeah. And it those was, are those are kind of like sought after now. They're kind of yeah, they are. They're act they're really cool. If you watch videos on them, you can make it sound like absolutely any other bass. It's it's wild. So I I mowed lawns. My mom was like, all right. Um, I'll get you a base or you can get a base and I'll pay for half of it. Just put up, you know, half the money. And so I went to Charleston Pond, downtown Bremerton, looked on the wall. I was like, that's the cool one. All right. I want that one. It was 175 bucks, 175 bucks. I paid half. My mom paid the other half. Uh, and I was, I was a bass player at that point. Yeah. yeah. And so I didn't, my second base was my first Ernie Ball Music Man Stingray. I remember us going and uh, looking at those down in Tacoma at like American Music or something. Like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. I put it on layaway. Yeah. <laughs> mowed some more lawns, washed a bunch of dishes, landscaping, whatever it was, and finally got it. Brought it back. Uh, the day I brought it home, we had a show. It's like I'm gonna go get that and play it to the show. And it's funny because not really knowing much about musical instruments, if I would have really known, if I had, if it was now, I would know. Oh, you have to like set it up, but. I went and got it from the store sure. straight to the show. Yeah. Silver didn't Dale, even change strings. I'm Silverdale sure. Community Center didn't change strings. I was playing with my fingers at the time. And back then I was used to having. You rested on the pickup, I remember, yeah. I would rest it on the pickup because the T40 had this like really great thumb rest that you would put. And all of a sudden the Stingray doesn't have that. And I'm like, oh my, I can't play. I was so, it was so awkward <laughs> to play that show. But, um, of course, I persevered. I got through it. I got used to it. I put a little. Uh, I remember we made a little piece of wood and we like screwed it in, sanded and... it down, painted it black, and screwed it into your guitar. It was great. It worked great. Yeah. So I I did that for a long time, and and of course I don't use my fingers anymore. But yeah. Um, wow, those are weird weird times. Uh, okay, so Gibson SG. Probably used that for a little bit, but then you went straight to yeah, Les I Pauls. I can't remember what my first Les Paul was. I mean, we had a Les Paul studio that, uh, mm. that oh, actually, there was a Les Paul studio in there too that Toothnail bought us for the first tour. Yes, don't know where that is either. Kind of remember that. <laughs> it was kind of one of the it was the same color that we always have, like the this is a maroon, yeah, it's like it was, the standard, yeah, like, just paint that guitar and get it out. The one I have now is actually maroon, but it's it's there's natural wood grain coming right. through so it's stained but the i think the one you had was actually like I, painted i can't remember honestly it was forever ago but painted yeah it was but... it was just another one of those things like but yeah after the sg i want to say i want to say i bought just like a les paul standard like just some brand new one off the off the rack or whatever yeah like a brownish one i don't know where that one is anymore either oh <laughs> god I've lost so many guitars. Where are they? <laughs> I have to have sold them or something, but yeah, I just don't probably. even remember. It's been so long. You probably sold one to get another, and you've got you got that off white right. custom. You got the um, all, oh no, the, the all black. Was the, it the all black custom? I got the black custom when we were recording Life in General. Okay, down in L.A. Uh, we were just about done, and Steve Crack and I went out to the guitar store one day, and I found it, and I was like, "Ooh, that's the one I want." And I think I maybe paid a thousand bucks for it. And that's what's cool about the you know the. Recording back in the day, I remember we would just go to like record, sh- well, not record shops, but uh, guitar shops all the time, amp shops. Even up here, not you know, LA has tons, but even in Seattle, Al's Guitarville, that's where I got my yep. my uh, P bass. Um, I got two P basses there actually. Al's Guitarville was really cool. Yeah, great stuff. Um, it's been 
I mean, there's been so many guitars over the years that you've had. I'm trying to think of when did you when did you finally pick up your reissues? Because those are what you you used most of, like the big chunk. Yeah, yeah. So I had that that black Les Paul custom. It was a '79. Is a '79. Um, and then I bought that like in like I said '90 late mid '96, I guess. And then uh, I played that all the time. It was my only guitar for a long time. Then I I ended up <laughs> I actually ended up winning a bunch of money on the craps tables at a at like little at like Caesars or something like that in uh, Vegas and then a couple days later we were at a we were in Dallas and there was a guitar show going on in town so I went to it and it was like vintage guitars and I wanted to get like a 79 another one like another custom because I figured oh, I'll have the same one but a little different and I'll just get a white one or something like that and I, I had it in mind because like uh, Mick Jones from The Clash and like you know Steve Jones from uh, Sex Pistols and they played them and I'm like yep that's what I want and I went out and found it at some you know, some seller, some booth there. And I was just like, oh my God, there it is. Like, I found it. It was even better because I'm like, I bought it with money I won from the casino. Yeah. It was great. I'm like, I'm free money. That's cool. a great feeling. Yeah. So those ones I had all through the late 90s. And then about summer of 2000, I was like, okay, these, these are getting a little worn out. Like, you know, I probably need to buy some new ones. Like, these are getting really beat up on the road. And, uh... I did the same thing where I'm like, well, I need to have a pair because I need to be able to switch guitars for tuning and for strings and all that. And uh, we had kind of started getting a little taken care of by Gibson. So I, I hit up this guy, Jimmy Archie, who was the product rep for Gibson. And I was like, hey, man, like, you know, I need to buy a couple of guitars. And I really like, like you know, the, the look of the 59s and all that. So he basically said, pick a couple of colors. And they, they had some, they weren't like specifically made for me, but I think they were like picked out for me by him. Mm-hmm. And there was a really good story because uh, Jimmy had a st- uh, office right on Sunset. Gibson had a big, you know, office there, and he had my two sitting on the ground there, and they were just in a case. And this guy Adam Day, who is Slash's guitar tech, he came in one day, you know, Slash and Gibson. That's like you know, peanut butter and jelly. Sure. Uh, so Adam Day was in there. He was looking at these guitars that were in there, and he pulled open one of the cases, and he saw my Cherry Burst, and he was like, "Ooh." what's this what's going on here and he was like oh you know it's for this guy and this band he's like slash wants this one <laughs> without even like yeah talking to like, slash like and jim he was like well, it's he already paid for it it's his he's like slash wants it though like he give it slash you know and he just basically he told me he's like i just told him no that's yours it's already paid for sorry it's not mine anymore it's his so that guitar it's got a little bit of story I'm sure Slash was happy with all his other guitars, but no, I got, he's, he's been restless ever yeah. since. <laughs> I got that one though, and I got a little bit of a yeah. Slash would have really liked this one. Cool. I mean, I guarantee he would have. It's a great guitar, and it looks great. Yeah, plays great. Can you can you explain a little bit more of why why um, the '59 reissues really struck you, and and why they're so expensive? To you know, just the look the look of them. I mean, I knew they they were gonna sound good. They're you know model after those old famous Gibsons, but just the look and the kind of like the like they feel like we'll get to your your current guitar setup and we'll talk sure. about that but they feel old even though they're not i mean they are now actually but yeah yeah <laughs> but well, they're, they're they, made too they yeah. feel like they're from 59 they've got that thing. they got that big thick baseball bat neck on them mm-hmm. and stuff and they had the same uh like nitrocellulose uh, finish that what they is that nitro cellulose just the way they finish yeah them. yeah instead of like just lacquer paint okay. like your, yours are just straight up lacquer um the nitro cellulose just uh resonates a little more mm. it's thinner yeah maybe that is maybe that's a big factor in why those guitars feel a little different they it feel... feels different too because i mean it doesn't feel like this solid chunk of paint it feels like it's stained or something like that but it's not just a stain it's also like kind of a well, it's nitrocellulose. I don't, I don't know what's in it, honestly. Yeah, what is that? We'll have to look that up. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I could Google it. Um, so, yeah, so so you had those. You still have those, I still technically. Have, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you went from those guitars. You've had a bunch of other guitars. First Act, some, some of the Secret Weapon video, you had that First Act guitar. That was a custom guitar you had made for you. Yeah, and then they also sent me some cheap Korean ones to smash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. So first act has been cool. Um, the funny thing is, first act, 
my contact there was Jimmy Archie from Gibson. That's right, Jimmy. Yes. Oh, that's the I ran connection. Into, I ran yeah. into him at Nam, and we were talking. I'm like, "What are you doing now?" He's like, "I'm working for First Act." I'm like, "You're working for? You went from Gibson to First Act?" <laughs> He's like, "Let me explain." Yeah. He's like, "We do so much money in like these little like you know fifty dollar hundred dollar guitars at Toys R Us that like." I get to do this custom shop and I'm running it for them. They basically, they went and they got Gibson's guy and was like, look, we got a, like a, a real pro now. Right. And he's like, I do anything you want. I'll make like, we don't have a certain style or anything. He's like, it's just, we'll make you a guitar and slap our name on it basically. Yeah. So I got, it was, I was into semi hollow bodies at the time. So I got a semi hollow body from them and it was modeled off of one of theirs too. So I'm like, that body style looks great. Just do that. But it's, you know, nicer wood, you know, like handmade, all that stuff. It's yeah. not, you know, made by a robot in China or something. Yeah. It was, those are those were some cool guitars. I got one as well. And yeah. They're fun. It was dope. So you, but you, once you, once you were, were ready to move on from the 59s, the reissues, what was the reason behind that? Getting old again? Just something uh, new? It just, so I had always heard from everyone oh classic guitars they sound the best and i'm like yeah i get that they're probably they sound good but like i'm playing like this loud distorted guitar it probably doesn't really matter and i remember we went to a vintage guitar shop in nashville and i played a like a 50s les paul jr and it just like i remember holding it and just strumming it and being like this sounds different than any other guitar i've ever heard like it's just like mm-hmm. It just resonates differently. It's the old wood. It's just, you know, the trees they were cutting down back in the 50s for guitars were like super just old growth trees. Now they're cutting down a forest every 20 years kind of thing. Yeah. So the wood was just different and it just it resonates differently. And then, you know, add economics into it. I got the junior one because they're cool and they look awesome. But two, like a 50s Les Paul is like 20, 30 grand. Like they're just really expensive. Yeah. I mean, you get into like a 59 Les Paul, like flame top and you're talking like, you know, quarter million, half million bucks. They're just, they're ridiculous. People invest in guitars, just like baseball cards, basketball cards, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty wild how much money you can spend on an, on a guitar. It's it's just a guitar. but. But the cool thing was with the, with the juniors is you can get into like a 50s chunk of Gibson wood for an affordable Affordable price. Affordable price. What's affordable? You think? What's mine was under five grand. Yeah, so, under five grand. Yeah, and the reissues went for about thirty five grand. Was it or not thirty five grand? Sorry, thirty five hundred. Uh, back back in that was the price we paid. Double that. Okay, what they so they were going for yeah. Okay, so I got like a half. I got basically a buy one get one free with Gibson. Nice. I got okay. a bogo. That's that's cool. So those reissues, the fifty nine reissues, retail for like they were like. Seven grand. Yeah, they're they're still wow. really expensive now. Yeah, insane. And I broke one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> actually, the cherry burst. You broke the neck off the head off. I, I broke Slash's guitar. <laughs> you did. You did. Yeah, we for everyone at home. Uh, we were practicing over at our old studio, and I had my guitar just on a stand. It was over by the monitor board, and I went into the house to pee or get some water or something like that. And I came back out, and Mike just looks at me. He goes, uh, "I owe you. I owe you a guitar." I'm like. What do you mean? And then he like points to the ground, and there's my guitar, a brand new guitar, sitting there, with the headstock broken off, hanging on by some strings. I was like, "What?" <laughs> so I, I can't even imagine what you must have felt like, because I didn't know how. Well, I'm sure I didn't know how expensive they were. <laughs> but. I mean, at the end of the day, I was like, "Well, we're gonna take care of it some way," so I'm not super worried about it. But some like, way somehow. Ended up talking to Jimmy at Gibson, and he's like, oh, no problem, we'll fix it for you. And he sent me a loaner guitar that I actually uh, kept for like a year, because it took him a year to get me my guitar back. But what they did mm-hmm. was they took it, and they stripped the finish off of it, and they actually steamed the guitar neck out, because they're glued in. Mm. And he actually steamed the guitar neck out and uh, just replaced the whole neck. So it, it's not like a, a headstock right. refin- re- like repair or anything like that. It's like, he said, it's... a brand new guitar it's just like new there's nothing different about it that's great it just was Amazing. refinished it was sanded one more time basically man miracle workers yeah seriously hey I you know what in imagine. the end at the end i got a free guitar over though because after that year i'm like what do you want me to do with this loaner guitar he's like just keep it nice like, yes and what was the loaner guitar 
It's a natural uh, Les I, Paul. I remember that one. Neil has it now. That's cool. Yeah. That was a good guitar. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so you, let's get into present day. So you were just talking about how you were in a shop and da 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 da. Yeah. You realized, wow, this sounds different. Just sounds different. The old growth wood. The old, the old wood just is different. It's like, I don't know. There's just something about them. I mean, like the way they look, the way they feel, is everything. It's just. It wasn't. It's not easy to pick up one of these. So what? What is this guitar? Can you tell everybody? Yeah, this is a 1956 Les Paul Junior. And this is your main guitar right now. It's my main. It's my main ride right now. Yeah. Has been since 2016. I got it like four years ago. Yeah, I think. 2017. About four years ago now. Like uh, all this, all this uh, wear right here. That wasn't like that when I bought it. That's you. That's for me just playing it. And this guitar, it, it it feels exactly how you were talking about how it feels different. It feels lighter. It feels like the sound just jumps out of the instrument off the strings. Yeah. And maybe it's it, it it's the wood for sure, but maybe it's the what were you talking about the the chemical instead of lacquer that nitrocellulose. So if you look at it, I mean, nitrocellulose. Look at, look at where it's chipping off. It's really thin, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Look at some of the chips on those uh, bases behind you. There, it's really thick. Like thick. It's, it's just a thick. This just moves with the guitar more. It just, uh, yeah. you know, not to knock those, but it's just kind of like it's more musical. The finishes. It's it's vibrating with the wood. You sure. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if my bases could vibrate with the wood because I just throw them around <laughs> too much. <laughs> I also I also liked about these in particular. There was less going on. One pickup. Yeah. Just a volume and, and tone. And it's a P ninety. It's a P90, which was different for me because I was always humbuckers the whole time. But And can you explain f for the people that don't know what the difference between P90s and humbuckers? So it's a single coil pickup, and uh, humbuckers are like dual coil pickups. Um, P90s are older style. It's like it's an older style, yeah. So like humbuckers, well, they were invented by this point, I think, yeah. I don't know what year they were. In the but, 50s? Yeah, they were in the 50s for sure because like 59 uh, Les Pauls have them. Late They're 50s, just more modern. They're more modern. They they humbuck. They buck the they hum. They buck the hum. Yeah. So actually, with this one, I have a, a Lenny Fralin uh, humbucking P90 in it. They did something to kind of get rid of because the single coil pickups are notoriously noisy. Mm -hmm. So being high gain and loud, it's going to get amplified and be even worse. So yeah. I was like, I got to do something. So I looked into a bunch of different pickups and stuff, and I found that one, and Threw it in. It sounded great. You know, I, I got a guy down in uh, Tacoma, this guy Joe Riggio, who works on my guitars. And uh, he had the guitar, and he had played a bunch of old ones. And he mm -hmm. had this and did, like, initial setup on it for me. He's like, dude, you got a really good sounding one. This one's really nice. And then so I swapped the pickup out because it was just yeah. it's, I had to get rid of that some of that hum. Because I played it for a while with the original pickup, and it was much more buzzy. Yeah. I was going to ask, what else besides the pickup have you replaced? Is, is it all original aside from that? Uh, Almost. So I swapped out the tuners, too, mm -hmm. because a set of tuners on these goes for about, like, the original, like, the 50s ones goes for, like, about five 600 bucks if you can find them. Mm -hmm. And the tuning, peg, the tuning pegs on them, that's just plastic. So plastic that's 60 years old, been through everything. I didn't want someone like Brad or Trevor changing my strings and breaking it and going like, oh, no. And then they'd feel horrible. So let me be clear. So when you got the guitar, you took off the originals. You're keeping yes. them. Yeah. You're using the, the yeah, Apple I, market. I have I have the original tuners and the original pickup. And actually, I'll get into the bridge, uh, the tailpiece in a second, but I switched that out too. Um, but I have all that saved with the original guitar case. I'm keeping all the, the, all, the, all the real stuff, of course. Yeah. But I made it like roadworthy and like a working kind of guitar that was going to really kind of be put through its paces. Cause, yeah. uh, so I switched those out. So we didn't break them. Honestly, that was the main thing. I didn't want Trevor or someone to break it for a show and make it hard to tune, make them have, they feel horrible about breaking it, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, I've seen some old ones where they're just like decrepit, you know, but then I also changed out the tail piece. So this is from a company called Mojo X and basically it's just compensated. It's going to be really hard to see on the camera, but, the, there's a little ridge on it for the strings where the string it's called the string break where the strings sit on the tailpiece and it's just slightly forward here and slightly back here just a little bit but it helps with the intonation mm. just makes it a little more true because you're really only intonating it by adjusting these set screws here and moving 
kind of the point of where it is and you got to move there's only two so you got to choose you know, like what do you do you know sure but i mean it's you know it's intonated great it's like yeah, yeah it's not it just, it's not it's solid it's not funky so how did you find this guitar did you, you i know you you bought it online i assume yeah i, I got it on reverb because they're just hard to find they're all they're like all over the place talk right? about that a little bit because it, it's not something it's easy just to find which is also why they're probably so expensive right a little bit yeah so they're they're available and they're out there but they're not like you can't just go to your local guitar shop and found find like five or six of them kicking around the shelf yeah. So I had followed a bunch of them on Reverb, and I watched prices for like a year. And I was looking at prices. and A year, folks. A year. I was putting in the work. You know? That is, that's, yeah. That's but not, I, was, I was following, don't do that I was following prices because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to get ripped off, you know. And I wanted to find one that I liked that didn't have any breaks. Because, I mean, sometimes, like, you know, headstock breaks. They break mm -hmm. it off, and mm -hmm. they just fix it, right? But it's never the same. Yeah. You know? So I just want to make sure there was no breaks and things like that. And, you know, being that it's old, it's going to have different levels of wear on it. So I wanted like a good amount of wear, but not too much, you know, like it just depends. Like, you know, there's some guitars that look like they've got recovered from like a shipwreck and they're just amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's some that are pristine, look like they just come off the, show, the showroom floor. And those are amazing too, but just found that balance, you know. Oh, I also switched out the, uh, I basically pot committed to this one after about a year of having it. I was like, well. I'm never going to read this guitar. So I switched out the strap locks to actual uh, Ernie Ball locking strap locks and I actually countersunk them. So I had to drill a little bit into the guitar. So the countersinking is awesome. But that was a little, little, little nerve wracking. It is, yeah. Well, Especially drilling into an old guitar. Yeah, yours are all countersunk too. Got these countersunk as well. Yeah. I uh, still need to do my artist series base. But yeah, it's, it's this is this one. Oh, ah! <laughs> this one right here is all the way in its flush. So, yeah. let me uh, fix that. Uh, yikes. Yeah, so like I said this was my main ride now or whatever. And the electronics are all still the same. The original pots, caps, all that. All They're all like, you know, date. They date correctly that they, you know, if they were ever swapped out, they were swapped out for the right stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. I love it. It's, it's a little lighter than a, than a normal... Les Paul too, which is nice. It's not arch top. If you can see, it's just flat. Really, Les Pauls, they got a bit of an arch to them. It's figured, but not this one. That's great. And this was originally supposed to be like a, a cheaper version of a Les Paul. And, but, I mean, they're sought after now. I mean, a lot of people play them. Brian Baker from Bad Rosen plays them all the time. Just a lot of people love them. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them. They're great. Sounds great. Let's talk about your amp setup how that's changed over the years and it had it took a long time to change but it's changed a little bit yeah i mean so over the years i've played a bunch of different things we were we were sponsored by mesa boogie for a long time so i've definitely so the first time i played a boogie was recording life in general see for vac had one that he was borrowing from mm -hmm. steve uh his roommate who played in 10 foot pole and so i was playing that and then steve kravak had a jmp which is what i have now which is an old 70s Marshall, mm -hmm. and uh, Sorry. yeah, I get, get, get it, get it. Um, but yeah, so that for that record, it's just a JMP on one side and a dual rectifier on the other side. And I remember, I had, I think I still had the silver, the uh, sorry, the uh, the JCM 900 at the time, and I was like sold, and I really liked the dual rectifiers because a lot of the California bands were playing them and all that. So I was like, I gotta check these out. So it ended up that uh, they. Mesa Boogie had sent Steve from 10 Foot Pole the dual rectifier, but he wanted the triple rectifier. So he was actually kind of looking to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, like Steve, I'll tell him, tell him I'll buy it, you know? And so I bought it from there. And that was my main amp for a long time. And then we would go on tour and like I started playing two amps and I threw in a Marshall with it. And I ended up getting a, well, what the one I have now, my Marshall JMP. It's a 1979 JMP. A friend of uh, Gloria, our old tour manager, sound sound engineer, uh, a friend of hers from Minneapolis came to the show, and he was a guy who had like worked on amps for Pearl Jam or something. She knew him, and he came out to the show, and he brought this JMP, brought it up on stage for sound check, and I played it, and I was just like, oh, this thing's awesome. And then I was like, Gloria, how much does he want for that? She's like, he wants five hundred bucks. I'm like, Kate, okay, so give him money. 
Like it's not leaving yeah. the stage, guys. Like <laughs> done. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Trust me. That that's a steal for those amps. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, that's probably the going price back then, but now they're just yeah. they've gone up a lot. So that was your first uh, old Marshall. Old yeah. Marshall. Yeah. And, and that has no uh, no channel switching. It's just gain. It's just it's got a master volume and a preamp. Yeah. So it's just. So it's got, you know, you can play it quiet and still have it stored. It's not like a plexi where you just have two volumes and you just got to crank them. But it's it's just, it's got that cool old, like, kind of 70s Marshall sound. You know, a lot of guys play the, that one. Mm-hmm. Why did you start playing, I kind of know the answer to this one. I'm gonna <laughs> sure, for them. <laughs> Why did you start playing two amps and how? And, and you know, as a three-piece, you know, we were yeah, well, just going for it. But. You just said right there, there's a three-piece. So there's only three of us, so we got to make everything sound as big as we can like we used to make yuri sing all the time like you know like <laughs> yeah <laughs> like yuri you know, here's your microphone you got man. a voice too dude get in it you know uh but yeah no it was, it was just to make make the guitar wider the sound wider how would bigger. you do it just uh i started with just like an ab pedal or an aby pedal i should say so you plug your guitar in and then it splits off to two and you just plug it into both those amps and mic two of them and you know you can do one to one side and one to the other and you know it's just different tones it looks cool too you got two amps back behind you all of a sudden you know nowadays i still do that like when i can i'll have two amps on my side and run two different sounds Mm -hmm. i'll do a combo and a half stack that's always great because you get that real kind of honky mid-rangey combo sound then you get that full half stack sound too and you turn them both on it's just like oh yes this is the stuff awesome yeah before i don't want to keep you forever but i do want to talk about sponsors yeah i feel like there's not, a, there's never enough time in the day to like, okay, let's talk about our sponsors. <laughs> but uh, well, you, but we, we've worked with so many great companies over the years and still do. Well, you talked about, you know, one already with Ernie Ball, but they were our first mm-hmm. real sponsor. Yeah. Where I was Ernie like, Ball's this is a great. legit company who's sponsoring us. And like, I remember, Strings, let's start. Yeah. Let's yeah. Start, start talking about strength. Grab that one because because I'm grabbing this one. I use, uh, I've been using these lately, actually, for acoustic. The Ernie Ball Everlasts, Mm -hmm. and they're awesome. They're medium lights, gauge 12 through 54. Uh, You know, from time to time, I'll just try new things, and these just really, I never have an issue with them. So, Yeah, so for me, I've been playing the Paradigms. I love them. So I had a problem with breaking strings. And when Ernie Ball, yeah, and when Ernie Ball came out with a string they said was, like, not unbreakable, but, like, a lot harder to break, I was just like... Game on, buddy. Pretty Never close. See that. Yeah. How has it been? You've been using them for a while. They're you, great. You ever break They're great. A string? They sound great, and I have not broken a string since Amazing. I started using them. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. There's also a thing with the with the junior is uh that it's since it's just on the tailpiece and it's got a easier it's got a a less extreme a less harsh string break that angle that it's at versus like a tune Mac bridge you break strings less on those two. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. These are the strings you used to use, or still do now and again. Just the regular, Some, yeah, just regular. Those are 11s. those are yeah, those are regular, different kind of slinky. But it's always been slinkies. It's been I played tens for a really long time, and then uh, when we did at the show, Bill Stevenson asked me, you know, like, hey, have you ever played elevens? I'm like, no. He's like, you should. He's like, yeah. they 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 ring and they sing a little better, and they do. And I mean, same thing, like a. Uh, Come back to Brian Baker again. He asked me about it one time. He's like, "What gauge string are you using?" I'm like, "I'm using 11s." He's like, "Good." He's like, "Those are the good. That's the sweet spot." <laughs> yeah, because you want to for, wanna... for fast, furious music with a lot of changes when you're just smashing the strings. You want to you want it to be able to stand up to the abuse, but you also yeah. want to have something that sings. I mean, you could put 12s and 13s on there, and like like look at piano strings. They're just thick as hell, but you hit them and they just ring and yeah. they sing, right? Mm-hmm. But you want to have something thin enough to where you're not having to like, you know be Arnold Schwarzenegger to fret a, fret a guitar, you know, yeah. and you want to be able to bend it a little here and there. So the 11s are kind of that sweet spot where it sings enough, but you can still kind of do things with it. Yeah, I agree. I haven't changed strings ever, to be honest, like bass strings. I'm talking, oh, yeah. um, let me check these out. Bass strings have been, well, my go-to bass strings have been 50 through 105, these things. This is a little bit, it's like a newer package, but mm-hmm. the green bass strings by Ernie Ball. <laughs> Regular slinky, 50 through 105. There's just no other, it's just like the perfect thing for me, for yeah. me personally, you know. Uh, the way I play, the types of notes that I play. And the cool thing with these two is, after all these years, Ernie Ball 
Still has our name on the back of the packaging. Also, yours truly right here on the side of the Ernie Ball box. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Always nice. There it is, yeah. MXPX right there. Right there on the back of the packaging. These are like the new ones. Like They've been really great to us. And Brian from Ernie Ball, Brian Ball, he's just one of those people that you're like excited to hang out with every time you get to see him, you know? Yeah, Ernie Ball is just, they're yeah. a great company. Love them. Obviously, I have an artist series base right here. You do? My first, hopefully not my last. But uh, no, this is uh, the Mike Herrera Artist Series Music Man Stingray by Ernie Ball. And it came out 2020. And uh, it's been going great. We've sold a bunch of them. Good. There's been, there's, there's bases around the world. <laughs> Mike Herrera. Pretty amazing. So it's a, yeah, it's, it's a it, it's a particular color too. Like it's gonna stand out when people yeah are gonna have it. It's not gonna be like oh a black guitar, you know. Yeah, and we could have done black. We could have done off white. Sure. And I was like, yeah, but have you know so many people have black guitars. So many people have off white. Not a lot of people have the seafoam green. I love it. Yep. So uh, I'm proud. Uh, I feel like it's a huge accomplishment. It's a milestone. It's it is. It's cool. It's it's an honor. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Ernie Ball. We love yeah, you. Seriously. Um, Mackie Gear, we're using the headphones right now. Yeah. We just did, you know, we just redid our whole PA, the locals, which is pretty amazing. We're gonna start using some of that stuff actually when we go out on tour. Yep. When we hit the road, we'll have speakers, we'll have our in ears, we'll have yeah. our our actual uh, monitor PA set up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all portable. It's all gonna be out on tour with us. So thank you, Mackie. You guys are awesome. Mackie's been uh, around a long time, and they've been just constantly putting out better and better products over the years and they've and they've sponsored us for a long time too they've been yeah. they've said they're local or on mm -hmm. the uh, seattle side of the water but exactly. they've always been really cool to us speaking of local shout out to silver city brewery you guys all know about it we uh we love to drink beer and it's great to have some friends in town that make amazing beer so we partnered with them uh for a 25 year that was a uh, secret weapon beer yep. And then we did Best Life Beer, a couple different rounds of that. And at some point, we'll probably come up with a new flavor and do another beer. We'll just say it now. We're going to do another one. We're going to do it. It may not be this year, but it'll be eventually. It's going to happen. Shout out to Silver City. Absolutely. Um, road mics. You know, we're using, I use road mics for the podcast all the time. Uh, we use them for use them live. Our, our live mics. Mm -hmm. And they have so many cool new products. Like I've been... I've been using these um, these little lapel mics that they have. They're like wireless. Yeah. So I don't even know what these. We'll are have to called. put that on for Yuri next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like this is like a little wireless transmitter that can go into your video camera, it can mm -hmm. go into your your recorder or whatever it is, your phone. So kind of fun to do. So anybody that gets creative, um, Rode Mic has is making all these products that are really really doing well uh, during you know, 2020, 2021, during the years of the internet where people are trying to get on and yeah. do live streams more and do more and more online um, content and online videos. And we're well, talking about road. killing it. Road, talking about road, road this is killing little it. recording setup you got here is great. Yeah, it's beautiful. They, they, they make so many different things. So they're from Australia. Um, I've never actually met anybody <laughs> that works for the company, but, but uh, shout out to Andy. For uh, hooking me up with them. Nice. He's uh, Andy, you know, Alonzo. Okay. Our, our sound guy. Um, Takamini Guitars uh, does, you know, sponsors our acoustic stuff. And uh, they're always great. Keeley Walrus. Let's talk about pedals. Keeley Walrus are, are yeah. kind of our partners So, yeah, Keeley, Keeley and Walrus are like the two that we really work with a lot. And they've, they actually have made us uh, custom pedals before. And they've hooked up a lot of different ones along the way. And. They're just cool companies because they're just they're based out of Oklahoma, which yeah. is crazy, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, there they are, you know, in the in the heart of the music, you know, business, in Oklahoma. A lot of great people in Oklahoma. Yeah. Shout out, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Oklahomies. Yeah. But yeah, they're great. They've uh, they got a lot of really cool stuff, and I got a couple of each of theirs on my board. So this all ties into, you know, your setups. You know, mm -hmm. you started out just amp straight to your guitar, maybe channel switching. When did you start getting into pedals? And then when did it become home, be, become a full-on obsession? 
Uh, so I got into pedals a little bit, especially during before the and after, because I kind of had to. Like we we did some sounds on the record that we hadn't really done before. Like there was like a flanger bit, and like there was like just different. Like you know, we were doing a little more lead type stuff, so I needed to to boost it up a little bit with a with an overdrive pedal. So I started I started getting more and more into them, and then you know as the years go on, it's just it's it's like drugs, you know, the first one's free and now yeah. you're just like, oh, I need more, I need more, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just got so many crazy ones every year. It's like, oh, going back to, uh, I think the first one I ever used was, um, I think on a record, the first pedal I ever, like effect mm-hmm. I ever used is actually this one right here. This is the Dan Electro Cool Cat chorus pedal. Oh yeah. This is like a $20 pedal on reverb right now. It's like nothing, but it sounds so great. And Jerry Finn, uh, it was the bridge of Next Big Thing, the clean right, part. Right, okay. We had just played it clean. He's like, oh, you got to throw some chorus on that. I'm like, oh, I don't really know anything. Like, Watch this. So he pulls this pedal out, and it sounded great. And like I said, it's like a $20 pedal. I think at the height, they're maybe like 50 60 bucks. They're just, mm-hmm. but they're, they sound great, and especially that one. It's just a really cool sounding chorus pedal, and yeah, I love it. So that was sort of, so Jerry Finn was maybe, when you're like, oh, maybe I should think about getting more pedals uh it was the first time i recorded it was more like he wanted it to sound cool for the record mm-hmm. and so i did it and then when we started playing live i'm like well i need to make it sound like the record so i'll do that um that was for ever passing moment that was you were talking about moment. B- uh, before everything yeah after, after i went that. yeah so then the next record is whirling really after we did like a phase thing there was delay on um don't walk away and so i had, I had a boss dd5 that i used for that mm-hmm <laughs> Yeah, I uh, just started getting more and more, and then uh, we were doing a a festival show, and it was a throw and go where we just like you know we have like fifteen minutes to change over and set up and play, and something was broken in my pedal board. It went like there was a cable that wasn't working or something, but I plugged into it and it didn't make any noise. Chain fest? Yeah, chain fest. Southern California. Yeah. So I just started tearing the thing apart. Finally got it to where it worked, but like it was right in time to play. And it was just so stressful that after after that show, I was sitting backstage. And I'm like, all right, I need to I need to like uh, I need to figure out like I need to get this pro. We're we're I think I said something to you. I'm like, look, we're a professional band, and I need to do something about this. I need to be professional in my gear. And you're like, yeah, go for it, man. So like, <laughs> yeah, I went. I I kind of went on like this little like a uh, pedal pedal board quest where like I researched like you know different pedal board makes and like who what kind of make and who makes this and like i started out just making like one out of like you know just like plywood with like some rhino line spray on it and like i i built an anchor into it for the cables so if the cables ever got kicked on stage it wouldn't Mm -hmm. jerk around with the with the connections on the pedals and then like got into uh temple audio which is from canada um yeah temple's great yeah they they make some really cool boards where it was like this metal thing and the the kind of modular attachment setup they had for it was like really appealing i'm like yeah that's perfect that's what i need i mean got into like cables i had some like make your own cables like george l and they're cool they sound good but they're not super reliable for being on tour all the time and so eventually things started falling apart on that and i thought i had it nailed and turns out i was wrong um i mean i went as far as like i locked tight it in the uh screws like they screw together i locked tight them together and stuff and i cranked them down and they just, they just started wearing out, you know, oxidization or whatever. And mm-hmm. so I ended up going, uh, there's actually a company over in Seattle called Sinusoid who they make really high end cool cables. And I took my pedal board to them and I said, here's where all the pedals are. Make it work. I don't care. Just like, I need it to be, I need it to be bulletproof. That's the word I always use for it. It's yeah. like bulletproof. Like I need, I need this thing to like survive like a car wreck. And, uh, Take it to NASA. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to survive like the, lo- rocket launching yeah so sinusoid they hooked up uh with all the you know they're called slivers they're these little tiny cables and they they solder them all in place and like it's like it's bespoke you know it's made for me mm-hmm. for that board like you know the cables are all probably different lengths but exact it's exactly what needed to be and yeah just work through it tried to i got a loop switcher involved too because i wanted to take as many things out of line as possible so if i plugged into one end and out the other the loop searcher basically you click it and it'll loop this one back in. You unclick it and it just goes straight through. Okay. So, so if there is a problem, you can you can bypass just, it. You can bypass it completely and your guitar will still work. 
So, so you have that. Just lots of what is that? What's what's the company that makes that? It's actually a company called Loop Switcher. This is this guy. It's just this guy in California. Yeah. Yeah. I I I ask you about your pedals like every now and then, and I'm like, what is that? And I point (laughs) at the thing, and you're like, oh, it's you know whatever. But you've got like really cool stuff on your pedal board aside from your basic you know distortion tuner right flange or whatever you've got um the keely digital workstation didn't you just delay workstation delay workstation you've got um well talk about the buffer that you use so i got a buffer from a company called uh dr scientist they're up in canada it's the coolest little piece of gear it's a cool it's a cool (laughs) it's a cool name for a company first of all dr scientist yeah but uh he has this buffer and it has a little led uh basically a view uh it's like the digital version when of a signal. Uh, yeah. yeah it's a digital it. version of like a needle. Right. And so it goes up and down when you play. And so if you're playing quiet, it's down low. And if you start hitting hard, it's like spiking up hard. And he asked me what color was my favorite color. I'm like, Oh, green. So he gave me one with green on it. But, uh, it's just a buffer basically just to kind of push through. Cause when you go through all the pedals, you can get like issues with kind of like signal degradation and all that. So it just kind of pushes through. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I got that on there. Got those sure wireless on there, which, was awesome to finally go wireless again because I remember we did a festival over in Japan, you know, maybe five, six years ago. And, uh, I was on a cable and the stage was huge and I Giant. couldn't, I couldn't get to the other side over by Chris and like I get close to him, but couldn't like go past him. There's something like you feel like you're a fish in, in a bowl and you, yeah. and you see the ocean, but you can't get there. <laughs> now I'm swimming through the ocean. Now you're swimming in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Those sure. Uh, it's the, I can't remember the exact number. It's the pedal one, though. It's, they're great. Yeah. It, and I love it, too. I <clears> use it as well for my bass. And I, it's honestly the best bass tuner I've ever used. Good. And it just is automatic. You know, a lot of bass tuner or a lot of tuners, when you're using bass, they, they can't pick bass, up yeah. the low fre- frequencies and stuff. And, I'm, sh- you know, I think Boss came out with a bass tuner <laughs> at one point. Like, why can't you just make them all work the same? Come on. Yeah. Bass tuner. So yeah, the the sure uh, wireless slash tuner pedal is great. I love it. Um, it it it's not flawless. I mean, um, it breaks after a while. Like one of my packs just died for for no reason, but um, mm-hmm. not for no reason. Probably because I used <laughs> you, it too much. You've been hard on gear for years too. <laughs> yeah, but you know, kind of now mm-hmm. that I know that, now that I know, like okay, just use it and it's gonna wear out. Yep. It's just going to happen, and then just be prepared. Um, I love it. So, okay, so you got the Dr. Scientist. you got the... Yeah. What else? I'm trying to think from memory, thinking about your 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 pedal board. Um, so I got I got the... I have an always-on, too. I have a... Uh, it's called an EP booster. It's a... So it basically models the Echoplex, which was a early delay, like a tape delay. But... Uh, the cool thing with those is a lot of people use them and they just turned the delay off and just had it on and plugging mm-hmm. your guitar through it just did a little something. And so I have I have the EP booster on all the time, but it's turned all the way down. Mm. Like as far as it doesn't like actually boost it all, it's just it's got like a three D B boost. Should like we be using that for recordings too? Maybe. Just just in case it's yeah. actually adding so, some cool stuff. So speaking <laughs> speaking of that, so there's actually something out there now that I wanna get. But it's expensive. What's that? Uh, it's called the Schaefer uh, Replica Tower. It's basically, it's a, like a, this company called Solo Dallas, they went and they like researched and researched and researched like Angus Young's guitar tone and especially like uh, the Back in Black era. Mm. And Tasty. Yeah, it's, it's great. It. It's a great sound. Um, but they found out that he was using this Schaefer wireless system, which was like one of the first wirelesses ever made. A lot, a of, lot guys, of people don't know <clears throat> that back in black guitars were recorded on a wireless. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know which kind, so you're. So yeah, so yeah. But, that's cool. So they were doing sounds for that record, and Angus just wasn't liking it. And Mutt Lang asked him, "Well, what's what's the difference?" And he said, "Well, I don't have my wireless." And he says, "Throw it in the mix." And it's it's got a thing. It's basically like a compression slash expander. They call it a compander, um, built into it because basically it sends. It was old school wireless, like they. We're trying to figure out how to work it and so it sends the guitar at like a crazy high level and then it compresses it back down to like a normal level mm-hmm. but in that it does something cool to the sound and uh this guy mark Nessi, who uh works for gibson now i was talking to him about it because i saw he posted with one and i'm like dude what's the deal are those legit and he's like 
it makes one marshal sound like a wall of marshals. He's like, it's it's like the secret weapon. He's like, it's no joke. Wow. Yeah. So that's the thing I'm looking at now. I'm like, what what is Wanda. it? What is the what is it? Is it an amp? Is it a, a no? Pedal? It's it's basically kind of like what I'm using the EP booster for. It's like an always on kind always of like on. like just like guitar enhancer. It just sure. it makes everything better. Is it a pedal? Is it in a pedal form? They have a pedal form, but Mark said it's amp. not as good. Okay. He said you want to get the tower for you. So it'll Chris, just go next to your amp and sits like right on top or next to your amp. Yeah. Chris from uh, Living End plays one too. Okay. He said the same thing. He's like, he's like the pedal's cool, but you want the tower. Yeah, he knows what's up. Yeah, no, that dude, that dude knows what's up for sure. <laughs> wow, the tower. It just the Schaefer, sounds cool. The Schaefer Tower, like the Schaefer Replica Tower. Yeah. By Solo Dallas. Huh. They're like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars, I think. But I mean, like, if it makes one amp sound like like you're like playing through like the cover of Kiss Alive or something like that, then it's worth it. Kind of cool. I yeah. think we should we should pr- try to procure one. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, like, we have so much gear here in the studio. We could pull together some gear, sell it to make money to buy gear we want. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, well, that's what I did with my, uh, so actually I sold one of my 59 uh, reissues. The, I had a Dark Burst one. Yep. And mm-hmm. I used that to buy the Junior. There you go. So I didn't, like, go out, like, I was. it was, like, kind of like an even. It was an even It was trade. a wash, yeah. Sorry, if you hear breathing, that, that's my dogs. <laughs> They're trying to get a little nap in. Trying to get a little camera time. Um, I don't know if you ever used it, but uh, Evertune Tuning Systems sponsored me. Yeah, and they're so, cool, but I just... They're I great for recording. For, I don't want to I don't want to route out like a 50s. Yeah, like, that's the problem. Is You, you have, have to route out a lot of wood. It's and a like, permanent... Yeah. Yeah, it's permanent when you, when you install one of those bridges. But what they do, for people that don't know, is... Is it's got a spring system, a weighted <clears throat> spring system, and it and it. This is, this is madness. I don't even understand it. It's magic, but somehow it knows when you you tune it. You're like, okay, I'm in tune, and then once you set that, it will always stay in tune. Mm-hmm. So if it's, you bend it's something, it, it's something of a balancing system with the springs. Yeah. So if you bend the string, it the the bridge will actually tilt or spring the spring will like Mm -hmm. move it it'll yeah it and so you're always in tune it basically fights you you have to tune it to the top end of its tolerance to where it would start moving and to where you'd actually be able to bend it yeah there are there's a setting where you can bend the first the 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 high strings so you can do like the chuck berries and stuff like that uh which is great but i think it's great it's just a certain type of of you got to get used to it for one if you're gonna do it live but it's great for like recording. It's great for if you have an issue with intonation, with saying in mm-hmm. tune, um, people that can't play. This is perfect for that. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Because yeah. the difference between you know when we used to, I just remember back in the day listening to like people that could really play. And be like, hey, like give me that guitar, and like I pick it up. Ah, yeah, it doesn't sound the same. <laughs> it's it's in the hands. This kind of helps with that. Like it, it helps you cheat, but. Uh, I love it. I, I, I haven't used, you know, I use it for recording now and again, but it's cool to have. Um, but they were coming out with a bass, and I just haven't heard anything. I, I don't think they could figure out the technology quite yet. They're probably still working on it. Throw it in one of your signature ones. That would be dope. Yeah. That would be dope. I mean, Ernie Ball already, are, their tuning is super solid. Their intonation is super yeah. solid. So, I mean, that would make it basically... Like a tank, yeah. Like you could throw it, <clears throat> take it into Afghanistan, and and It'd go through still all be the, the landmines, and it's still going to be good. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Did what? Did, what did I miss? What are you thinking of gear wise? Did I miss to ask you about? Because the go pedals. Through, let's go through signal chain. We did the guitar, the wireless, the pedal board. Ran through the pedal board. Out again, sinusoid. So the long ones that run back to the amp again. So I plug in the power for my pedal board the same place I plug in the head because you get less grounding issues that way, less buzz. So if you're plugging into the exact same, yeah, same box. outlet, yeah. box, whatever yeah. it is. Uh, so I run that back. Sinusoid made a, a uh, you know, just a regular old extension cord too, but it's obviously not regular. It's fancy because they make yeah. good stuff. Run that back. You got the uh, 
the head, which I was talking about, different heads. I got the uh, GMP I play all the time now. That's what I'm playing on all the live streams. On the uh, the record, on the self-titled, we played, uh, Chris and I both used my Bad Cat Lynx 50. Mm-hmm. Just a really good sounding amp. People are like, what? Bad Cat? This is the first we're hearing about this. Yeah. yeah you never cat. play it live, though. I don't play it live now. I don't I don't take that one out on tour. It's a... It's a it's a fancy amp and it's nice and it's just it stays here. It's delicate too. It's a little delicate, yeah. It seems like I've it. I've blown it up once before. Yeah. But That's uh cool. so then going through some of my cabinets, I got a, a 70s Marshall cabinet. A lot of like the old cabinets were made of just like a big, you know, thick chunk of wood like this versus like some of the newer ones are made of like, you know, kind of like particle board and stuff and mm-hmm. they just don't sound as good. Mine are really heavy, but that's because they're made of thick wood and that's the point. It sounds better, you know. Yeah. So then in it, I got a, I got Celestion 25s on the bottom and Vintage 30s on the top. So it's actually a 110 watt cabinet. But uh, just two, same thing. Just try to give a, a fuller sound coming out of one box by having two different kinds of speakers in it. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. That Yeah, the two different kind of speakers is a little hack thing that, yep. that I don't remember who told us about. but Gloria did that. Was it Gloria? So I had, okay. I had a cabinet. I used to run two cabinets on stage and I had one that had thirties and one that had 25s in it. And she's like, do you mind if I just like take two from one and put them in the other and vice versa? I'm like, if you think it sounds good, she was the pro. I'm like, if you think it sounds good, do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She did it and it sounded great. And I'm like, hell yeah. Yes. She even drew a little picture and taped it to the back. So we'd know which was on top and bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you know what? That picture is still, it's there. still taped there. Yeah. It's amazing. That is some strong tape. It's some strong tape. Yeah. yeah, that's about it. I mean, you know, after that, it goes through the PA and does its whole thing. Mm-hmm. What about in-ears? Can you talk about in-ears? Because you, you didn't really yeah, use I didn't, those. I didn't use them for a long time. I used them way back, and they were fun and all that, but, like, I don't know, these kind of seemed like more hassle than they were worth. And when we started playing shows a lot again, I just used regular old, like, triple flange, like, silicone earplugs, and I could hear myself singing really good in my head, like, and I felt like I was maybe singing better than I ever had with the band, so I was like, ooh improvement like we're, we're getting better in our old age you know <laughs> and then we got the in-ears for the live streams and potentially you know we were doing it and for like our flyout shows we could have like some consistency and we do all these flyouts and i tried them and now it's like it goes through an app on your phone and you can dial your own mix in so it's a lot less like hey man can i get a little more of this and did he really give me some snare didn't he like i know what's going on and i can yeah. make it sound just how i want so it's it's pretty sweet we saw five iron doing that and we were like ooh. We yeah. want we want to, want to copy that must do yeah I mean that's that's really you know that's a great sort of ending topic is we learned so much just by seeing mm-hmm. and I think people learned from us well, as well monkey see monkey do out on the road that's how it was back in the day like we would go on tour we would see face to face with their guitar like maybe you know their guitar going a certain way We're like oh let's try that or whatever yeah. but um. You know, just having conversations with Bobby from Bad Religion or whatever about yeah. the way he does his drum stuff. It was just like always something, right? And I think, I think it's been a great ride. It's been, yeah. it's been amazing to get to see something, try it for ourselves, realize it works, yeah. and then you find something new. You find something else new down the line. I I've been using. These try, you know, these try with the triangle picks. I don't yeah, know what sure. you call it, like tri picks. Triangle. But I didn't know about these until I, tr- you know, I started using them on bass. I don't even remember the story behind how I started using these, but I think you just. I remember you saying like, because you played the same style, like shape of pick as me, and mm-hmm. I remember you were just like, I like it. It's more, it's more to hold on to, basically. It's just I got a big hand, and <laughs> you know how that goes. But <laughs> but then I started using these on guitar, and and then getting like thinner. Gauge well, picks. now that you're used to them, you know, yeah. Since we're talking about picks, by the way, we should shout out to Intune, Intune yeah. Guitar Picks. They're a great company on the East Coast. Intune Guitar Picks. They make all our custom stuff, and they can make anything. And yeah. I really like the quality of what they make. They're pretty cool, yeah. I love it. So, thanks. Um, anybody you want to, anything you want to? I also brought over this pedal, about? too. I was going to show off just real quick. This is from 1981 Inventions. It's called the DRV. Uh, it's an overdrive pedal. And actually, Matt Hoops from Reliant K makes this one. Mm. This is his company. Wow. Um, 
Let's see Jack from Bayside. I think maybe Ethan. Our buddy Ethan Luck uh, has helped make those. He's it's it came out. It was kind of a hit, and then like he was like, "Oh, go ahead. oh, God, I gotta make I gotta make a bunch of them," and so he's got a bunch of our friends helping him make them. That's dope. And it's it's just a cool overdrive pedal. Good job, Matt. Yeah. See, and that's where that's where it all leads is is finding something you enjoy and making it. Yep. Very cool. What's next for uh, guitar setups? Is, you know, I know we talked about the tower. Yeah, but, um, Schaefer, Schaefer Tower. Schaefer next. Tower. That's next. Uh, eventually, with our flyout stuff, we may do a, a Kemper setup, which would be cool for consistency on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Kemper is great. We used it on the self-titled album. And a little bit, yeah. A little bit. Things that we're doing. But I think the, the if we go to the Kempers for the flyout thing, it's just going to provide consistency for Chris and I. Pair that with the in-ear thing. It's consistency all around. I mean, the only thing that's going to change really is, like, we're going to put some microphones on some drums and some microphones in front of our faces. And after that, it's it's going to almost be like we're on tour with our own gear. It's going to be great. Yeah. 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 I love it. All right. Um, dude, thank you so much for talking about gear, talking about MXPX. Um, we're going to keep rolling. Hell yeah. New stuff Always. soon, hopefully. Can't yeah. keep waiting. We're going to work on that. Um, work on some new shows coming up. Yep. Yeah. So. It's going to be great. Cheers. Cheers. Let's do one more ending in case that okay. really sucks. <laughs> uh Man, I feel like we don't talk about gear enough. Um, so this was fun. I yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, it's I, fun. I love talking about gear. Yeah. We, we could go on and on. There's so many things that we didn't even talk about as far as, like, other companies we work with, other things. You know, like, yeah. skivvy underwear. You know, I use <laughs> wear my underwear. You know, like, that, that kind of stuff. But uh, gear being the main thing, uh, if you – if you – Okay, here's a good question. Here's a good way to end it. All right, I have one last question for you. If you were not a guitar player for MXPX, but you had all the knowledge that you do, and you weren't doing what you're doing right now, you're like, okay, here is an undisclosed amount of money to invest in a new company. Do you have any idea of what you might want to do? Probably like a, like digital guitar modeling. It's going to be the way of the future. It just is. I mean, like... You look at Kemper, uh, you know, Line 6 is doing it, Neural's doing it. Neural, I'm really excited to check out the Neural, uh, the new, like, pedal board they have. It's just, like, it looks like it's basically like an iPad with some pedals on it, and, like, it does everything. And It seems like that's going to be the way it's all going to go. Yeah. People will still love and buy classic amps, but no one's going to take them out on the road anymore because, like, you know, they're delicate. Like, I'm going to play my Bad Cat Lynx 50 every night on tour if I can because it'll be stored in my digital amp you know? yeah that's perfect that sounds yeah. great i can't wait for it Definitely. maybe you can do both yeah maybe you can also start a company but dude thank you i appreciate it of course man all right thomas nesky everybody cheers everyone <laughs> cool as i was i was actually i don't know if we'll ever do this but i had an idea we should remake chick magnet now. <laughs>